saying to Rose uh, b- before church, uh, when we look at the Bible, I know, I know it's a book. It's given to us by God. <laughs> but what's it take to get through this book? W-O-R-K. Work. All right? Study. That's what Paul says. So, today let's do this. All right? Let's go to Second Thessalonians. Subject matter is persecution and the Lord's coming. All right? I'm going to take this out of... Uh, 2 Corinthians chapter number 5. Now we have verses 5 through 8 there, I believe, on the, on the board. Okay, but what I'm going to do is begin in verse number 1 and read the whole chapter. All right, so if you want to just listen to that, and then we'll get going here with, with the message. All right, so it begins in verse number 1. Paul and Sylvanus and Timothy to the church of the Thessalonians in God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Grace to you and peace from God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. We ought always to give thanks to God for you, brethren, as it is only fitting because your faith is greatly enlarged and the love of each one of you toward one another grows ever greater. Praise it. How's that happen? What did Dan talk about this morning? A little humility, right? Therefore, we ourselves speak proudly of you among the churches of God for your perseverance and faith in the midst of all your persecutions and afflictions which you endure. This is a plain indication of God's righteous judgment so that you will be considered worthy of the kingdom of God for which indeed you are suffering. For after all, it is only just for God to replay repay with affliction those who afflict you and to give relief to you who are afflicted and to us as well when the Lord Jesus will be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels in flaming fire dealing out retribution to those who do not know God and to those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus these will pay the penalty of eternal or eonian it should say destruction away from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power when he comes to be glorified in his saints on that day and to be marveled in all among among all who have believed for our testimony to you was believed to this end also we pray for you always that our God will count you worthy of your calling and fulfill every desire for goodness and the work of faith with power, so that the name of our Lord Jesus will be glorified in you and you in him, according to the grace of our God and the Lord Jesus Christ. So let's have a word of prayer. Father, thank you for the opportunity to open your book. Uh, An opportunity, Father, to look at your plan for mankind, particularly the Thessalonians at this point in time and their persecutions. Now I would pray, Father, that you'd open our eyes uh, to the truth of it, give us an understanding of it, and we'll thank you for that in Christ's name, and amen. Now, these are first generation Christian brothers. They're actually our brothers, aren't they? As, as, as we look at this, of Thessalonica, endured torment, and they, re- they endured torment because they accepted the Lord Jesus Christ as their Savior. All right? That's why this happened. I want you to notice something. Come over to 1 Thessalonians chapter number 1. 1 Thessalonians chapter number 1, please. Okay? And let's notice verse number 6. Here Paul writes to these dear folks, You also became imitators of us and of the Lord, having received the word in much tribulation with the joy of of the Holy Spirit. So they received the word how? What's it say there? In tribulation. All right, they received this word. But they became imitators of us. Now this was written before 1 Corinthians chapter number 11 where Paul told those folks, be, imita- you know, be imitators of me as I am of the Lord. All right, so this began early in Paul's, that, that mindset of Paul's ministry. Then I come over to chapter number 2 of 1 Thessalonians. And notice, please, verses 14 and 15. For you, brethren, became imitators of the churches of God in Christ Jesus that are in Judea. 
So what kind of churches would be in Judea? Would we say Jewish churches? Sure, I think we could say that. For you also endured the same sufferings at the hands of your own countrymen, even as they did from the Jews. Their own countrymen. Okay, the Jewish countrymen. Who both killed the Lord Jesus and the prophets and drove us out. They are not pleasing to God, but hostile to whom? To all men. Hostile to all men. Who are? These folks that are persecuting folks, all right? Hostile to all men. Now, the second letter then that we just read, bless you, Chuck, the second letter begins essentially the same way. So Paul does what? He praises them, verses 3 and 4. We ought always to give thanks to God for you, brethren, as it is only fitting because your faith is greatly what? Enlarged, thanking God for their enlarged faith. And the love of each one of you toward one another grows ever or ever greater. Therefore, we ourselves speak proudly of you among the churches of God for your perseverance of faith in the midst of what? All your persecutions and afflictions which you endure. So why is this happening? Why is Paul praising them? Because they chose to believe in Jesus of Nazareth as their Messiah. That's why they're suffering. So, when we look at verse 4 here, folks, and we see the word <laughs> uh, persecution. Actually, my Bible has afflictions. Afflictions and persecution come from the same root word in the Greek. All right? Same, same root word. Persecution refers to to being pursued. In other words, if you're being persecuted by someone, they're pursuing you. They're chasing after you to do something to you, all right, as we see this. So afflictions and tribulations, then, refer to pressure and oppression and intense distress that comes upon an individual. And that's what Paul's talking about here with the Thessalonians. They're being chased and pressure is being put on them, all right? And they're suffering because of that, because of their belief in the Lord Jesus Christ. Now notice this, that perseverance and faith in the face of persecution and afflictions or tribulation leads to two points of reassurance. This happens, but there's a reason it happens. And God uses that reason. The reason is their belief in our Lord Jesus Christ. So the Lord uses that to do two things. Number one is this. It's an indication of God's righteous judgments. He says that right in the passage. Because he's going he's gonna to afflict the people that are afflicting. Okay, which we'll see here in a, in a little bit. Okay. The second thing is this. Their worthiness for the kingdom of God. Because they're enduring this. And as the song says, no turning, I choose not to turn back. They're not turning back. They're hanging in there during the persecution, so God perceives them as worthy of what? His kingdom. Uh, keep your finger here, because I'm coming right back. Come to Philippians, please, in chapter number 1. Philippians chapter 1. All right. Now, this is a common verse to us. We've seen this quite a bit and spoken on it in the past. Verse number uh, 28 in Philippians 1. In no way alarmed by our opponents. Who would opponents be? These people are persecuting them, right? These opponents, it says here, which is a sign of destruction for whom? For them. But salvation for you, and that too from God. So it's a sign, man, these folks, something's going to happen to them. You understand that? Because they're afflicting the people of God. And there's a reason for that, which we're going to see here in, in just a little bit. All right? So come on back to 2 Thessalonians with me. And let's notice verses 6 to 8. And this is the, the majority here of our message as we look at this uh, this afternoon. All right? Now, <clears throat> notice verse 6. For after all, it is only just for God to repay with affliction those who afflict you. It's only what? Just? What's that mean when you read this verse? Anybody have an idea? It's only just for God 
to afflict these people that are afflicting you? What would we say? It's only fair that he would do this, all right, as we see this. In other words, it's just for God to repay afflictions and tribulations for those who are bringing affliction and tribulations to the believer. Um, I'm going to turn back to Galatians, read your verse. Galatians chapter number, what do I want, 6, and verse number 7, where it says this in verse 7. Do not be deceived. God is not mocked. For whatever a man sows, that he will also what? Reap. And that's what we're talking about here. Do you know, a little sideline, all sin, all sin, no matter what it is, is judged right on the earth. Whatever a man sows, he's going to what? And it happens right here. doesn't happen in heaven. doesn't happen in hell. It happens right here. It's all taken care of because that's what a judge or a just God does. I should say judge. It does. All right. When we go to 1 Corinthians chapter number 3, it talks about judgment. We call it the judgment seat of Christ, right? What happens to the individual as you read that? Some things are, gonna, are good, but some things that they do in life aren't so good. What happens to the things that aren't so good? They burn away. What's that mean? Have you thought of that? Okay, and when are they destroyed? In heaven somewhere? They're destroyed right here. When you recognize what they are, wood, hay, and stubble, you take care of it. All right? Yourself in, in your life through the Spirit of God that dwells where? Within you. Now keep that in mind as you look at these things. Okay? So as I look at this, when, I'm going to ask you this question here. Letter written to the Thessalonians, their enduring suffering, all right, from their countrymen. Just as the Jews in Judea suffered because of their countrymen, other Jews, all right? So when did this affliction and tribulation begin for the believers in Thessalonica? Have you ever noted that in your readings? I'm, I'm looking. I got blank stares here. <laughs> Come back to Acts with me, chapter 17. All right. Come back there. Let's answer that for you. Acts chapter 17. And uh, let's pick it up in verse number 1. 17, 1. Where it says this, Acts 17, 1. Now when they had traveled through Amphilopolis and Apollyana, they came to Thessalonica where there was a synagogue of the Jews. So there's a synagogue of the Jews in Thessalonica. And according to Paul's custom, he went to them. Who's them? That'd be the synagogue. And for three Sabbaths, he reasoned with them from the scriptures, explaining and giving evidence that Christ had to suffer and raise again from the dead and saying, this Jesus whom I'm proclaiming to you is the Messiah or is the Christ. So that's what Paul is speaking about, where? In the synagogue. Who hangs out in the synagogues? The Jewish folks, all right? And some of them were persuaded. Well, praise the Lord for that, amen? And joined Paul and Silas, along with a large number of God-fearing Greeks and a number of the leading women. So a lot of the Greeks believed, God-fearing women believed, some of the Jewish folks from the synagogue believed. All right, y'all read that, right? Verse 5, but the Jews becoming jealous and taking along some of the wicked men from the marketplace. The Jew, why were the Jews jealous? They're, okay, they're losing the people from their synagogue to what Paul's talking about. What was he talking about? This Jesus had to die had to be raised from the dead, he indeed is your Messiah. Okay, that's what the word Christ means, okay? When you see that. So, he says, and taking some wicked men from the marketplace. That's what these Jews do. So what did the Jews do? Use your imagination. They're in a synagogue. People are believing on Jesus as Messiah. All right? Many of the, the Greeks were. Many of these devout women were. All right, so these Jews are jealous, so what did they do? 
Okay, they went to the marketplace to find some of the bad guys to say, hey, let's go. I imagine they paid him. It doesn't say that. To harass and persecute and put people into tribulation here. So as we see that, now watch what it says, the rest of verse number five. These wicked men from the marketplace form the mob and set the city in an uproar. Sounds like some cities in the United States. And attacking the house of Jason, they were seeking to bring them out to the people. When they did not find them, who are they looking for? Paul and Silas. When they did not find them, they began dragging Jason and some of the brethren, the believers, before the city authorities, shouting, These men who have upset the world have c come here also. And come here also. Where, where else have they been? Other places in Greece and around. And so the word has been gone around. Okay. And Jason, verse 7, has welcomed them, and they all are act contrary to the decrees of Caesar. Now, isn't that strange? They don't bring it to their religion. Rather, they make it a what? They make it a political thing. See? This has been going on for years. It's been going on since Cain and Abel. Act contrary to the decrees of Caesar, saying that there is another king, Jesus. Now, most Christians fall into this. Because most Christians look at Jesus, I, he's going to come and he's going to set up a throne, physical throne in a physical city, in a physical temple in Jerusalem. He's going to be King Jesus right there in the physical. Isn't that what they say? But yet, was Jesus king right here? Yes. He was king in the spiritual realm. He is our king. The kingdom of God right here, as Dan said earlier, the taste of it was there. It was beginning. It's going to come to a fulfillment and a, a total beginning just a little later on in history here. All right? As, as you see this. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Okay, I got you. Yeah. Now, I don't know if the, the Zoom people heard that, but <laughs> it's not Paul that's causing the problems. And the Jews, Dan just told us, uh, they had to go to the marketplace to find people rabble rousers to do this because the rest of the people in the synagogue didn't care. See, that's a good point, Dan. Thank you very much. So it says in verse 7 again, And Jason has welcomed them, and they all act contrary to the decrees of Caesar, saying that there is another king, Jesus. They, and he was. He was their king. All right? They stirred up the crowd and the city authorities who heard these things. And so even the authorities were brought into this. And when they had received a pledge, now, what's the answer to everything in the, in the world? Money. Thank you. They received a pledge from Jason. Today we'd call it a bond. Okay? And others, they released them. When they came up with the money, it didn't matter if there was another king. To them, you know, the authorities, they just wanted the money. So the persecution, what I'm trying to tell you is this, started here in Acts 17 in Thessalonica. And as we look at this, all right, <laughs> and actually look at it, uh, was God justified then in turning the tables on these persecutors of his people? Well, I think he was. And I'll show you that in just a minute, okay? Uh, well, let, let's move on. Because what we find is this, that when Paul talks about this, come back to Thessalonians with me, Second Thessalonians. You know what it sounds like? It sounds like Exodus chapter 21, verses 23 to 25. Now, I know you all have Exodus memorized, but I'll bring it to your mind. <laughs> okay, okay. An eye for an eye, right there in the law. And that's what it sounds like. And God's using that to justify. He's just in doing what he's going to do, okay? Now, 
Verse 7 then, when you read this, and to give relief to you who are afflicted and to us as well, when the Lord Jesus will be revealed from heaven and with his mighty angels in flaming fire. That's, that's the Lord's coming. But to give relief, relief means freedom or liberty. All right? They'll be freed from what's going on. Uh, I'll give you an a, a illustration of this. If you want to keep your finger again here, come back to Acts chapter 24. See what, see what uh, we're talking and Paul's talking about here. Acts 24. And in Acts 24, please, let's look at verse 23. Now, this is a situation where Paul uh, was saved by the Roman soldiers because the Jews were going to tear him apart. You read the whole chapter there, all right? But when we look at verse 23, I think that's what I said, wasn't it? Okay, yeah, 23, it says this. He gave orders to centurions for him, this is the commander, all right, verse 22, for, uh, for him to be kept in custody and yet have some freedom and not to prevent any of his friends from ministering to him. So he's being persecuted by these Jews. Paul is. They're going to rip him apart. And the Romans intervened in this. And the commander said, hey, take Paul, keep him in custody, but don't lock him in a dungeon. Give him freedom so his friends can come and see him. That sort of thing. So he's being freed from what? the persecution and tribulations that these Jewish folks, because of Paul's teaching that Jesus Christ is indeed the Messiah, all right? He's given a relief for that. Can you follow that so far? All right? Pretty simple, isn't it? All right? It, it really is. So when, though, is this relief? Well, let's come back to Thessalonians chapter 1, okay? Chapter number 1. And to give relief to you who are afflicted, and to us. Now, how many times have I mentioned to you, you should go through your Bible as you read, and where you see the word you, you should do what? Circle it. Do it a different color. Why? What's the purpose in that? Audience relevance. Who was the letter written to originally? These Thessalonians. So you have to view it in their terms. Not our terms today, okay? Their terms. So when are they going to get their relief? According to verse 7. And to give relief to you who are afflicted and to us as well when the Lord Jesus will be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels in flaming fire. So when are they going to get their relief? These people in Thessalonica. When the Lord appears, okay? That's when they're going to get their relief. We have to keep that in mind. When the Lord Jesus will be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels and flaming fire, which we'll talk about in a minute. Paul was referring to Jesus' return, okay, as occurring before those whom he had made the promise of relief would die. Now, we're, we're suffering here. Paul understood that. So what did he do? He said, listen, relief is coming. All right. It's not the only place. I've been in my New Testament now as I, I read through, I've been putting in yellow. Actually, it's a, a creamy yellow color. I underline every time Paul makes a statement in, re, in, in relationship to the soon coming of the Lord, in relationship to the people that he's writing to. And it's all over his writings. Now, let me keep going here with this, okay, so that you understand what I want to get to. Thus, this assurance was not their death but rather Christ returned to give them relief of their mystery, uh, of miseries and vengeance to the persecutors. Now, there's a lot of passages. I'm going to read a few passages concerning this. But watch this. What, why, would, why would God's, if we want to call it wrath, on these people, why would that be a relief at his coming to these people that are being persecuted? Let me ask you something. If I was persecuting Carl, okay, making his life miserable, and the police came to me, you're not doing that anymore. We're going to do something about it. What would happen with Carl? He'd have relief because I could no longer what? Persecute him because I'm being taken somewhere. That's the whole idea here. 
God's coming to give them relief because these other people are going to be suffering. See? And as long as they're suffering, the only people they're going to be caring about is themselves and not the people they used to persecute. Does that make sense to you all? Okay, I, ho I hope it does as we look at this. Now, there's other passages here in the New Testament that have that same concept. So let's look at a few. Uh, come back to Col uh, 1 Corinthians, please. 1 Corinthians in chapter number 1. I'll just give you, I think I have five of them or something here. Written down six, I'm sorry. Okay, so 1 Corinthians and uh, chapter number 1, please. Now notice verse number 6, actually 7 and 8. 7 and 8, 1 Corinthians. It says, Who will also confirm you to the end, blameless in the day of our Lord Jesus Christ? God is faithful, through whom you were called into fellowship with his Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. Now notice verse 7. So that you are not lacking in any gift, waiting how? Verse 7. Okay. Eagerly, the revelation of our Lord Jesus Christ, who will also confirm you to the end blameless in the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. Who? You. Who's you? It's the Corinthians he's talking to here. All right. Uh, come back to 1 Timothy chapter number 6. 1 Timothy chapter number 6. I get my pages apart here. Verse 14. Here he says that you keep the commandment. Now, who is you here? Timothy. Book is written to Timothy. That you, he says in verse 14, keep the commandments without stain or reproach until when? The appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ. So Timothy is to hang on. Now, Paul also tells Timothy, hang on. <laughs> Don't let go of eternal life, doesn't he? All right? Until the appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ. Until he dies? No. Until the appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ. Come to Titus, please. Titus chapter 2. And let's notice uh, verse 13, where it says this. Looking for the blessed hope, and appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. Now, re read what's before it. Read what's after it to get your context. He's talking to whom? Titus. And what's he tell Titus? We're looking for that blessed hope and appearing. Who's looking for it? But see, like Americans today and, and Christianity today, every generation from about the year 200 has been looking for that coming. Okay? And in every generation, what has there been? Prophecy preachers. You know what they do? They make a bundle of money. The Lord's coming this date. Uh, now just mark it down. Now Titus was looking because he knows what Paul has been preaching, that it's in our generation. Because that's what who pre preached? The Lord Jesus Christ. This generation, not that generation. Okay, now let, let me keep going here with you. So Titus is looking forward to seeing Jesus. When? After he dies? No. He's looking for the blessed hope and appearing. Come to Hebrews chapter 10. Hebrews chapter 10 and verse 25. Hebrews 10 and verse 25, which says this, Not forsaking not forsaking our own assembling together, as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another, and all and all the more, encouraging one another, and all the more as you see the day drawing what? Near. The day drawing near. Notice verse 37. For yet, in a very little while, he who is coming will come and will not what? He won't delay. Okay? The day, as everybody else, will that happen in the day of their death when they're in presence of the Lord? No. Right there during their time. Okay? That hour is drawing near. Now, two more here. James. Let's come to James chapter 5. Then I'll wrap this up. 
James chapter 5, please. Uh, boy, oh boy. James chapter 5, and let's notice, please, at verse number 7, right? In fact, we'll start in 6. You too be patient. Now, who did James write to? Well, let's go and find out. Verse 1. James, a bondservant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ, to the twelve tribes who are dispersed abroad, greeting. So the dispersia, those are diaspora, we call it, those that were scattered. Now watch what happens. He says, you too, be patient, strengthening your hearts, for the coming of the Lord is what? What's it say there in verse number six? The coming of the Lord is near. We're in chapter 5, verse 6 of James. Okay? You all got that? Oh, I'm sorry. That's verse 8. Forgive me. My circle went through the top part of, of the 8, so it looks like a 6. All right? As you see that, then verse 9, Do not complain, brethren, against one another, so that you yourselves may not be judged. Behold, the judge is standing where? Right at the door. Okay, right at the door. Be patient. Strengthen your hearts, for the coming of the Lord is what? You know, if you want to believe he hasn't come yet, and you're waiting, oh, it's 2,000 years. Well, maybe it's before 5 or 6 or 10 or 20,000 years. Why did you think that it'd be this generation? Oh, because of the signs of the times. Signs of the times are in every generation. Dan and Lisa were kind enough to give me a, I don't know if it's kind or not, a puzzle, <laughs> so, <laughs> a 500 piece, of, and they're, they're little guys. But within it is, is a uh, picture of what the puzzle is, and it's the front page of the New York Times on the day of my birth, September 5th, 1947. And you, you could put, what's today's date, 18th? You could put September 18th, 2022 on that page, and it's the same thing. I mean, it's just amazing. Every, every generation, we, we see that. One more place, or maybe two. You're not in a hurry, are you? Is that fire going out there, Carl? Gordy got the fire going? Okay. All right. Let's, let's come back to a Revelation chapter 2. Then I'll take you back to Thessalonians. Okay. Revelation chapter 2. Let's notice verse 25. The speaker here, by the way, is an angel that got his words from, who do you think? The Lord Jesus Christ himself. All right? And in verse 25, he says here to the church of Thyatira, Nevertheless, what you have, hold fast until I come. All right? until I come. Now, I turn all the way back to chapter 22. Okay. Words here, the Lord Jesus Christ again. In verse number 6, And he said to me, These words are faithful and true. And the Lord, the God of the spirits of the prophets, sent his angel to show to his bondservants, the things which must soon take place. That's back in chapter 2 and 3. And behold, I am coming when? Soon or quickly. Blessed is he who heeds the words of the prophecy of this book, etc., etc. Come down to verse 10. And he said to me, do not seal up the words of the prophecy of this book, for the time is, what? Near. Verse 12. Behold, I am coming quickly. My reward is with me. Verse 20, right down to the end, right at the end of Scripture, it says, He who testifies to these things. Who is he who testifies to these things? That's Jesus. Yes, I am coming quickly. Amen. Then John adds, Come, Lord Jesus. The grace of our Lord Jesus be with you all. Now, watch what happens here. Come on back to Thessalonians, please. And we'll see if we can close out here. A little bit. <clears throat> In verse 7, right at the end, it says, 
from heaven with his mighty angels and flaming fire. Now, if you remember, last month I did a message on believing the word of God. And I told you once a month on a Sunday, I was going to add to that. Okay? I'm going to add to that. I have been trying the best I could to do everything slowly and in order. There's things I want to tell you, but I'm afraid to tell you at the moment. It has to have a foundation as, as, we, as we go on. All right? Because if I told you some of the things I really believe, you'd say, oh, wait, 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 no. What about this? What about that? What about that? And you're saying that because you don't have a foundation of what's going on. And so that's what I'm trying to do here. Okay? Very, very smoothly uh, do this. So when we see this then, it says here at the end of verse 7, from heaven with his mighty angels in flaming fire. Now, what do you imagine when you see that, when you read that? I mean, come on, what, what, do, you, what do you imagine? Just let your imagination go. How did you get saved? How did you get saved? You heard the word of God, and you had to imagine something. You had to imagine that what Jesus did for you, because you never saw it, did you? No, but you believed it. And why did you believe it? Something in your mind told you to believe it. And what is it? I had to imagine this really happened. And it's, being, it's been transmitted to me by a saint of God or just by reading, however it happened for you, okay, in the Word of God. And so you're believing it. But what's, what's part of it? It's your mind and your imagination. Yes, this happened. This is how much God loves me. I've never seen God. But in my imagination, I have. My favorite song is what? I can only imagine when you're in his presence. So what's he saying there when he's singing that? He's letting his imagination go to the time. Man, will I dance before you? Or will I get on my knees before you? You know? So don't be afraid of that word imagine. Because that's what happens here as we look at this. So what do you, when you read the end of that, what do you see? What, what goes on in your mind? What, what do you see? Gail, <laughs> that's, that's it. Scary. Something scary. It is. Well, fire and brimstone coming down. Okay. Now watch. One of the things that I taught you when we first started on preterism was how God himself appeared three times in the clouds at the destruction of Babylon, Assyria, and Jerusalem. And he used the armies of these other people. But he says, no, that was me appearing in the clouds. So the angels come, all right, and they come for a purpose to gather, as, as you see. But, but the whole thing is, where does the flame of fire come from? It doesn't say it comes from heaven. It, it doesn't, no, it doesn't say that at all. It comes from the Roman soldiers that were battling in uh, Jerusalem starting in about 66 AD and go through 70 finally. And all that was taking place there. They burned the place down. And most of you have Ed Stevens' thing, right? You got a PDF on your computer? You can go read the history of it. It's very interesting. So this flaming fire was what was caused by the Romans in Jerusalem. And who was it against? The Jews. And who were the Jews, according to Acts 17? They were the ones who were causing the persecution. Rome, in Acts through here. In fact, Rome doesn't persecute the Christians till you get up toward the end of the first century, all right? And the reason they begin doing that is because they realize there is another king. Okay? And it's King Jesus. But at this time, the persecutors weren't Rome to the Christians. It was whom? It was the Jews. And what I'm getting carried away here because I don't want to stop. In Matthew... The Lord says, your fathers did what? 
They killed all the prophets, and their guilt is upon you because you killed the prophets. And so vengeance is coming. And that's part of the second coming. We call it the second coming, but the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ was vindication for who was the greatest prophet they killed? The Lord Jesus Christ, a prophet like Moses. See? So this persecution took place, and Paul is telling them, hey, it's coming. He's coming. And he's going to give you relief because he's going to put the persecution on them, and you'll be relieved. And what did the Lord tell the Jews that were believers to do that were in Jerusalem? Flee. Get out of town. So they had warnings 40 years before it happened. See, as, as you look at this. So when we look here at, at Jerusalem, and that's what was flaming, okay? You see Acts 17 again. It was the Jews that caused all this. The Jews that were unbelievers, okay? It was this city with its, how would you say? I wrote this down. I, I copied out of a, one of my commentaries. It's stars, moon, and sun religious leaders. Because that's what they were worshiping. They got totally away from Yahweh. Okay? That the edict came down to men like Saul of Tarshish himself to imprison and even kill believers. Jerusalem, the Roman armies. I have written down here Ed Stevens. The final decade before the end. So hopefully, folks, you'll notice that persecution is connected with the coming of our Lord. And you can read about that from our, wor our Lord's own mouth in Matthew 5, 8, and 17. His coming is connected with persecution. The persecution of his saints is one of the reasons he came back when he came back. Take vindication on those. And who was it? It wasn't the whole world, because they weren't persecuting them. And in Acts 17, why were those men from the city doing it? Because the Jews put them up to it. See? See, do you, you hate Jews? No. Today, what are the Jews? The Jewish folks. I know lots of Jewish folks. They're just like you and me. Do they persecute you because of your faith? No. Are they doing that in Jerusalem? No, it was a particular time frame, okay, that you see that. So I better quit because I could talk all day on this. But the whole thing is this. See this, the persecution is attached to the coming of the Lord. Maybe the next time we talk about this next month, I'll take you back and show you how the coming of the Lord is in the clouds. And it says, every eye shall see him. What they're seeing is the clouds. What did Paul see? In Acts 9. Did he, see, did he see the Lord? No, he saw the light. Okay, and, and you'll see that even with Stephen. So that's where we are. So we'll leave it, leave it there for today. Yes, that's the Jews at this time. Yeah, right. Uh, now watch. In the back, we have the magazines. They just sit there. Nobody takes them to look at them. Some, some get them at home. You ought to see how the believers in other nations are living. Okay? But in America, who persecutes believers? Believers do. Believers do. Okay? And it's, it is sad. But God bless us. And he will continue to do that because he loves us, right? And we are to love everyone no matter what, even those that persecute us. So that's, that's where we are. So